And next we're gonna have our ocean law panel, um, starting with Myron Nordquist, and then we're gonna have John Briscoe, and then I think we'll have them both up here to answer your questions. Can't quarrel with somebody that leaves you with your opening anecdote. Uh, the, uh, the famous John Craven that he referred to was uh, also uh, heavily involved in a feint that was going on. Uh, I was the secretary of the U.S. delegation, so I was a peon, but all the information came in and I had to decide who got it, so I had to see everything, and I did. What had happened is that uh, the Russians, at that time the Soviet Union, had lost a nuclear submarine. And they didn't know where it had gone down. It was in very deep water, kind of deep water where there were manganese nodules. <laughs> and we had a, a, a SOSIS, it was called a system that went from Iceland across over. So we, we knew when their submarines came out, we knew what their signal was, we knew where that submarine had gone down. So how would we raise it without, you know, first of all, they're coming to get their own property. And so <clears throat> the subterfuge was worked out with Lockheed and Global Marine Development Corporation. And it was that the CIA funded uh, manganese nodule prospecting ship. And <laughs> it had un unseen consequences. Um, first of all, when they came out with their ship, and this was their cover, um, immediately it, it inspired two other companies uh, that said, if, if they're spending all this money on this, it must really be something in this manganese <laughs> nodule business. So, Two other companies uh, in the U.S., uh, Deep Sea Ventures was one of them, Kennecott another, but they um, started to put money into exploration and, and you know, eventually yeah, there was like $200 million spent on, on looking for manganese nodules. But in the meantime, the, the end of the story is that this uh, develop, uh, this, this uh, ship that had been developed to raise uh, and John Craven was one of the people that knew about it. It's covered in his book. Uh, so I'm not giving away any secrets here. Uh, John gave them away, actually. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, this ship went out and uh, was successful in uh, finding the broken submarine and uh, did raise it. Uh, we did uh, secretly get it to uh, our laboratories, and, uh, and, and there were nuclear weapons on it. And uh, so the story turned out well. After, uh, this is a teeny little anecdote, after the wall came down, uh, I happened to be one of the people, I was teaching at the Air Force Academy at the time, and so we would go over and try to talk to the, the Russians. Uh, it's now Russia, not the Soviet Union. And uh, one of the first times I was there, there was a, a, a meeting that had, they, they always overdid it, but there were like 16 people on this platform, and I happened to be the only American there, and one of the uh, nuclear submarine commanders from uh, Russia uh, stood up, and he, of course, I can't understand anything in Russia. Mm -hmm. They gave this long, uh, really nice speech, and when it was translated, what it was, he was thanking me as an American, because when we raised that submarine, we gave full military honors to the, the Russians uh, that had been the bodies that we got out, which was kind of a little interesting anecdote. But that's what I'm going to talk about, really, uh, taking the lead from George. I'm gonna, I've been in this business a while and, and have had interfaces with seasteading, and so I'm going to just walk through some of the, those interfaces, and, uh, and uh, I just told you one of them. Uh, but actually, my involvement, uh, I didn't know this, it started in 1965. I'd, I'd graduated from uh, Oregon State Naval Science and got a commission in the Marine Corps. A couple years later, I found myself as the 
S4 uh, for a 1,500 man uh, battalion landing team that was going into initial landing in, in Vietnam. And as the S4, it was my job to get the beans, uh, bullets, and bandages uh, to the men that needed them. Didn't have women in there, Marine Corps band. And uh, so here I was aboard a, a, a regular carrier, and it was everything. It was the supply ship, it was the garage where we had our vehicles, it had an, an, a you know, fixed wing and helicopter uh, airport with it. Uh, it was a hospital, and we, we put that to use very soon. So you had your proof of concept already that a, you know, a floating city can be very uh, effective in uh, supporting large people and even in pretty dire circumstances. So the next time that something came up by accident, uh, I was in law school in San Diego, and because uh, I wasn't a lawyer in the Marine Corps, and um, the American Society of International Law put out a, uh, a, a competition. And uh, it was a national competition. And uh, the subject was based on something called the U.S. v. Ray case. And that case involved uh, some private corporations that wanted to establish what amounted to gambling casinos. Uh, four and a half miles off the shores of uh, Florida. And uh, of course, there's nothing that, you, 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 a lot of scientists here, you know the laws of physics that nature abhors a vacuum. Well, that, that isn't anywhere near the force of how bureaucrats react when there's something that they don't have control over. And so they for, were frenetic, uh, fr frenetically trying to figure out how they would get control over this, and what they came up with was that this was a continental shelf area, and that uh, it required a drill and dredge permit from your friends, the Corps of Engineers, and uh, they hadn't gotten one. So they went in, and the court, of course, wringing its hands. Uh, there also was an issue of they had uh, a trespass case, but the, the, the first part of the holding was that the U.S. didn't have <coughs> ownership or sovereignty over this area that was at that time beyond its territorial sea. But the second thing was that it did have an interest because they were occupying a portion of the continental shelf. I mean, considering the continental shelf and how dinky that little bit they were occupying was on those reefs, it might be a stretch, but that was what was held in the case, but it raised the whole concept of the of the uh, continental shelf, what it is and what will it be. And uh, so anyway, we, we won that national competition and I got uh, two years of, of, of education available at Cambridge in England. And uh, so the North Sea Continental Shelf cases had come out in fall of 1969. And uh, so I was studying these things and one of the things that was coming up there that was rather colorful were pirate broadcasts. So I was studying these private broadcasts. What had happened is that during World War II, uh, partially for the invasion of Normandy, the uh, Allies had gone out and they sunk down uh, a couple of towers. I think they were called mulberries. But in any event, the point is that they, they used them in the invasion and then afterwards they had been abandoned. Well, some enterprising person, uh, Again, I, th th these weren't that far. They're, you know, less than five miles, but beyond three miles, off the coasts of England, and uh, so they were all wringing their hands. What are we going to do? These guys are, you know, broadcasting without a license from us, and uh, so uh, eventually, uh, there there actually was a case where they 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 had some guys that went out there and they got shot at, and then the the, the government. Uh, uh, made these British citizens uh, come and they, uh, the court actually said that, well, it isn't really US, I mean, in that case, UK territory and so on. But, uh, and the guys issued a lot of interesting stamps and coins and uh, it's, it was called Sealand. Some of you have studied the histories know what I'm talking about here. Uh, anyway, I, I looked at that 
then I, I went to, foolishly, I uh, accepted an offer to be in the Office of Legal Advisor in the State Department, uh, which uh, had just, was just about to start an office on Law of the Sea. Uh, it was all getting geared up. This was in 1970. And uh, what I did, by the way, for, for my dissertation at Cambridge is I wrote it on deep water ports. And you may or may not know, but we have very well developed legislation in the United States administered by the Maritime Administration that deal with deep water ports. So if you're, one of your seasteading ideas is to have a deep water port, you already have a developed legal regime for off the United States. But uh, anyway, in the State Department then, well, as John indicated, I got involved deeply in the law of the sea. That's all I did, uh, where we would have these interminably long meetings. But e essentially, we set up uh, the, the regime that was mostly a codification, that is to say, of what states have been doing. Because if you have two ships that are coming at it, each other, you have to have agreement on what you do in the oceans. And that, that had all been worked out for a very long time. Uh, so there were lots of rules, but there was also a lot of new stuff. And one thing he didn't mention that I think would be relevant, particularly if you go to environmentally uh, alert California, there's also uh, provisions in the Convention on uh, Marine Pollution. They're mostly aspirational because when they were formulated, you know, our, our environmental movement really started about 1972 with the Federal Water Pollution Controls Act. So it, they're, they're not very developed in the convention, but all the, all the guidelines are there. The big principles are there. And uh, so you, you, you will have to deal with the environmental issues if you want to do anything off California, for sure. Uh, and the law of the sea would will, will, will kind of set the ground rules, but the, believe me, this, this state will think of lots of other stuff for you. Um, one of the things that happened is that when I was uh, sitting in my office one day uh, in between meetings, uh, this, this guy poked his head around the corner and he, he was kind of a deceived old, uh, as they say, robust man, good suntan, and, uh, and they asked if I'd talk to him. I said, of course, yeah. One <laughs> in the State Department, you don't do much anyway. So uh, <laughs> he, uh, it turned out he was Ernest Hemingway's nephew. And he, uh, he had sailed with two female com companions to uh, these reefs off the Bahamas. And they had uh, erected uh, a, a frame set up there and uh, with a platform, and they'd occupied it for, for several months. He'd left the ladies there, and he'd come back because he wanted the State Department to recognize their new country. And uh, <clears throat> couldn't understand why that wouldn't be a good idea. Well, I said, hey, you know, you're, you're, you have a problem because you're occupying, an, you have an artificial installation on the continental shelf of the Bahamas. And uh, so the, obviously that's an illegal uh, construction. And obviously the State Department isn't going to recognize you as having a new country uh, when you're engaged in an illegal occupation. It really wasn't even an occupation. But I, I was giving him all the benefits of doubt. Anyway, he went out of there very discouraged and uh, went back to his two ladies. And as far as I know, you know, they sailed away and never came back to bother me. But I had, I had another uh, interesting experience where I was, um, again, sitting in my office, and uh, this guy came in, uh, Dan Tafui, who is a Secretary of Cabinet for Tonga. And uh, we had nego I did a lot of stuff with the islands. And we had negotiated uh, for several years already at the Law of the Sea Conference. And uh, of course, I said, Dan, what are you doing here? Come on in. And uh, anyway, he said, well, I, I, I am here with his majesty. I said, what? And then this guy that was six foot six, weighed at least 400 pounds, was in an English, or at least a formal wedding morning suit with a top hat and a, and a, 
and a monocle, a, a black rim monocle, came in, you know, very dignified. You know, I'd been slouching behind my desk with, John, uh, with Dan, but I, I stood up with and he introduced me to the Crown Prince of Tonga. Well, they came in because they had a problem with a, the Republic of Minerva. <laughs> Republic of Minerva was a, 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 started out on the Makelsfield Bank, which is, they were really, no one's really sure. That there's a little, if you, if you Wikipedia them, it's a little bit unclear what they are, but most likely, well, one thing is that when the, when the low tide is there, there are pieces of land that stick up, or dirt anyway, not dirt, probably coral and sand, but the point is that they're almost islands. And, and so <laughs> there had been some American entrepreneurs uh, that had gone to Australia and got a bunch of sand and brought it in there and dumped it down. And uh, I don't think they put much to, to make cement, you know, so the thing would stay. So it's only a matter of time before the rest of it would be reclaimed by the sea. But anyway, they had declared the Republic of Minerva. And again, if you're really a stamp collector or a coin person, you can, you can find these things uh, on the internet that they issued. But uh, the, the Tongans were very concerned about this. Uh, and so, uh, you know, are you guys going to protect your American citizens? Well, hell no, we're not. We don't protect anybody, especially if they're Americans. <laughs> and, and so he, uh, they, they went away with our assurances. And then they had a meeting with the South Pacific Forum, and they, they decided that Tonga ought to, you know, be the place that had this, and so there they were. They, they, they didn't have a navy or a coast guard, but they, they somehow got a New Zealand tugboat. The king of Tonga, the father of the, the father was big too, but the, the father of the crown prince had got with, with the local constables uh, and, and I guess two or three palace guards and a four-piece band <laughs> chugged out to Makelsfield Bank and, and uh, kicked the, uh, the guys that had been uh, trying to claim it and then with great fanfare took down the flag of Minerva and put up the flag of, of Tonga. <laughs> so that, that stood for a while. But you know, the interesting thing is that just a few months ago, uh, one thing that happened in the meantime is in, in Fiji, uh, the Melanesians overthrew the regular government. These are the, the, the you know, cannibal type guys that and they had been conquered in the past by the, by the Polynesians who are the uh, Ratamara who was the father of their country and so on was uh, uh, you know a Tongan basically a king that came in and conquered Fiji. But the, the, the guys that are now in charge in Fiji are Melanesians and uh, they have driven off a lot of the Indians and uh, not many of the Tongans were there left anyway. But uh, in all, the, the, the son of, of Ratumara had somehow been gotten to one of the islands that was near and he was escaping from the Fijians. Uh, and, and so the Tongans sent in and they rescued him and took him back to Tonga. And, and there was almost a military confrontation because they're still arguing about who has the control over this Makelsfield Bank area. <laughs> and so, I mean, as of a couple months ago, this thing is still festering. And uh, in the normal case, if, the, if Ratamara had still been in charge, they would have settled it easily, I'm sure. But because the Tongan government doesn't recognize this uh, military takeover. These guys got all their training, by the way, fighting for the UN, you'll be happy to know. They used to send them over for nickel and dime money from home and they would serve as blue helmet guys. So they were pretty, pretty well trained by the time they, they took it over. So the, these things sometimes, uh, you know, these island disputes, we have them in the South China Sea right now. And uh, we could, I've done two conferences on this. I could. 
tell you more than you want to hear. You maybe already heard more than you want to hear. But anyway, um, during this course of time I was in the State Department, I also went over to Japan where uh, we went aboard a, a floating city that they, well, it wasn't really a city. It was like a floating big platform that they had. The Japanese have done a lot of work on this. Part of it is simply because, uh, you know, Tokyo Bay is a pretty darn expensive place. Japanese are very competent engineers, and so they have done quite a bit of work. Um, I had a couple other uh, run-ins when, uh, well, uh, I was, uh, as John mentioned, I was the uh, general counsel for the Air Force, and uh, during the first uh, Gulf War, uh, I happened to be there, there then, and I was handling that sort of stuff for the Air Force, legal stuff. And uh, there was a lot of serious consideration given to these um, mobile offshore bases. And the whole idea there was you would take like uh, four of these uh, modular floating, the kind of submersible type things, only bigger, that you were talking about, George, and showed the picture of. And uh, so they would, they would, the concept was they, they would drag four of those together, or maybe six, depending on how much uh, the airplane or C-17 or whatever needed, and uh, they would then not have to go and operate off, uh, you know, land bases where it was very sensitive. In the first war, you know, we had 30, well, 31 allies, and so we had, you know, Syrians fighting, and Saudi Arabians fighting against Saddam Hussein and so on. Quite a different political setup than in the, the second Gulf War. But there was a lot of thought given, but then they were finally able to, to work it out with, with other countries, and, and particularly because there was so much Arab support in the region for that first Gulf War. So they kind of dropped it off, but the, there's been a lot of your good old taxpayer money that has been spent on the designs and thinking about, uh, I think, their kind of floating city. And then uh, the last one I'll mention is uh, I just came back uh, two weeks ago from uh, St. Petersburg in Russia. And there I did lecture to what it amounts to their Maritime Academy a couple times. And uh, anyway, the point is that in Russia, and maybe some of you know this, uh, at the Baltic Sea Yard uh, shipyard there, they have built a floating nuclear power plant. And uh, it's an unholy alliance between these oligarchs that are, you know, in Gossbaum. Uh, all billionaires, you know, have stolen the oil and gas in, uh, in, in Russia, and they have lots of money and influence, and, you know, it's, it's, it's Russia again. <laughs> they got the oligarchs uh, that were nothing different than the people that have been ruling Russia ever since it began. Uh, and um, they have made an unholy alliance with the uh, nuclear power people and uh, the government. And so this is an ice-clad platform. It's done. It's, it's, it's going out within the next month. Uh, they have orders for five more. It is ice-clad, and they're going to take it up to a place where uh, it will provide the power. They're using the uh, engines. That's not probably the right word, but you guys know what I mean. They, they're, they're using the power plants that are aboard, that they've developed for their nuclear uh, fleet, their nuclear submarines in that case. And uh, they have two of them. And they're, they've got orders for five more. And uh, so they're going into very harsh conditions uh, but it's also pretty heavily subsidized. But it's a lot more expensive to make a platform that's uh, ice classed than it is to make a regular old one. Lots of people in this room know a lot more about it than I do. But anyway, the point is that, that uh, there, there has been some proof of concepts. And by the way, I thought it was interesting because you say nuclear and everybody, ah, you know, hysteria. Uh, but, you know, I, I was watching uh, the news before I came out here on Memorial Day. And, uh, you know, there was a U.S. enterprise parked 
uh, uh, I think on Governor's Island, in the heart of New York, and uh, you know it's got its nuclear engines there, doesn't it? I mean nobody's panicking about it; they're all loving it, and so on. In Honolulu, how many nuclear submarines do you have that are there? There's some all the time, and I bet there's some nuclear carriers that go in too. So, it. I, it, it seems to me, if you, get, if you want to be like you people are supposed to be, people that think objectively and look at facts and forget your prejudices, I think that one of the things that you ought to look at, and it, someone back there mentioned it uh, in passing, uh, I think you ought to look at the idea of having uh, uh, power stations such as they have on the Enterprise, a couple of them. Uh, we know it can be done. The Russians have done it. And uh, if there is ever a state, this state has not built a power production facility for 30 years. So all you wonderful environmentalists, all you're doing is making people like the people in my home state of Montana bear your warm swimming pool bills with the people building them in our backyard. Uh, all the power that you're getting is coming from other sources. And just because you don't build them in California or have them offshore doesn't mean that somebody isn't generating it. I mean, when you plug in that electric car you're feeling so good about, you know, it's, it's from coal-fired power production. Or if you're burning the gasoline, I got news for you. It, 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 it's just a simple proven fact that you pollute more, besides giving all the money to these guys that killed 3,000 Americans, you, 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 you are uh, having all this tanker stuff go back and forth. And for those of you that are mariners, you know you're pumping the bilges, you're shooting the stuff in the sky, and, and, and then we walk around saying, oh, well, we couldn't possibly, you know, pump the oil. And then they'll say, okay, well, deep water horizon. Well, that's true. And we have a conference coming up solely on that. Uh, at our center in Halifax, uh, June 20th. The lessons learned from Deepwater Horizon with the best people in the world that have, are, are looking at it. It's very serious. But the last one where he had a well blowout was 47 years ago in the Santa Barbara Channel. Well, that's a pretty good track record if you look at facts. But if you're, you know, I've got my prejudices, my God, I don't wanna, I'm not, you know, you're not gonna. <laughs> I'm not going to give them up just because of the facts. Facts are really troublesome things. But I think for, for you folks, if, 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 if you don't look at the power needs, and I don't care, you can, you can put them off Mexico and wheel it in and do it the hard way, but um, this state's going to continue to use a lot of power. And uh, I think that uh, part of the equation, not the solution, part of the equation might be to uh, look at at power production, using all the good old Uncle Sam dollars that have been put into, they know how to, they know how to build a nuclear facility, and they know how to build them safely. And unless you let, let the hysteria get in, uh, people don't mind having them in the heart of Honolulu or the heart of New York. Or frankly, there's probably one down in Long Beach. I don't. Maybe there's one in here. I don't know. But the the point is that they're they're. 100% legitimate safety issues that are really important, but it doesn't mean that you, you, they ha can't be coped with. And so I think it's an area that you might think of. Uh, with, with that, I'm going to stop and... Uh, You've got 20 more minutes to go. <laughs> no, no, you tell better stories than I could ever do, but anyway, I, I think what might be... You, there's a lot of expertise right here in this room, and it, it would be kind of a shame I, I don't have to be the, the center for, for questions, but if anyone has questions, I mean, let me, let me just exercise the prerogative since I'm standing here. If you want to ask somebody else that's in the room something, I'm, I'm happy to have somebody else answer.